Do you believe in reincarnation or resurrection? Do you believe the world will end? And if so, what will happen to us? This video is a journey into understanding what our ancestors thought about life, death, creation, destruction, and with this resurrection and reincarnation, as this was all part of their understanding of their cosmos and what happened at the end of their cosmos, their eschatology. And so, if you want to learn about this, then grab yourself a cup of tea and welcome to Crack and Fault. Growing old, the effects of aging is seen in Indo-European culture as a form of erosion where your body and its life force are gradually worn away over time until one dies. We see this in their language in how old figures are described, particularly Geron, who became Charon and the figure we know as the fairy man of the dead, described as an old and worn man. His name, with a component of the pi verb ger within it, means to age or to fall apart. And if you don't know his story, well, it is fascinating and much, much older than Indo-European culture. His story is told across Europe, Asia, Siberia and North America, suggesting it is at least 30,000 years old. But I digress and we'll link to a video at the end of this video if you wish to watch it. But for us now, the fact is that the journey to death, or perhaps it is better to say the journey through life, was a process that could not be stopped. And even if you thought it could be slowed down through various acts or rituals or consumption of medicinal libations, death would come to all mortals. It is inevitable. And it is the clue of the meaning of the Proto-Indo-European verb ger and its many cognates across the Indo-European landscape alongside mur that allows us to say life ends in death in the same way that something that is eroded falls apart. It dissolves its complexity into its constituent parts and we see this reflected clearly in Indo-European languages and I'll show examples of these on the screen now. And perhaps a clearer way to explain this is when it comes to life and death and that erosion is considered a separation of the body and soul, which we see in these linguistic examples. But if you want a specific case of this, then a good example is from one of the earliest Greek inscriptions we have, where the fate of the soul after death is discussed. This is found on the burial spot of Athenian soldiers who died at the Battle of Potidaea in 432 BCE and the inscription there reads Aether received their souls and earth their bodies. Here the word soul is a translation of the Greek term psyche which literally means life breath and we also see this repeated in many Greek texts such as in Homer's classic the Iliad which has the passage and his psyche left him and a mist poured down over his eyes but he reawakened, and the breath of the north wind blowing led him back to life. He who had evilly breathed forth his life force. If we considered this in its most basic form, the soul was considered the air that resides within us when we breathe. When it is there, we are alive, and when it is not, we are dead. But of even more important to us is to answer the question of where our ancestors thought our breath went when we died. And the answer to this is that it goes back into the air, back into the part of the cosmos from where it originally came. And on top of this, we see many Greek accounts of where the human body is said to be created from Earth. And this inscription also informs us that at death, the material of the physical body returns to the Earth. And we find an explicit example of this in Suppliants by Euripides. Let the corpses now be covered with the earth, from which each of them came forth to the light, only to go back thither. Breath, here the Latin noima was used, to the aether, and body to the earth. But this wasn't just a Greek belief, it was a belief across Indo-European cultures, and we see in two related passages from the oldest Russian epic, the Slovo or Blaku Igor Ervi, or the Songs of Igor's Campaign, 
which was written shortly after 1185, that the fate of those fallen in battle is metaphorically compared to the treatment of agricultural seeds, an agricultural symbolism which aligns to the splitting of the body. The first passage reads, On the Nemiga, which refers to the riverbanks of the river Nemiga, sheaves are spread out with heads on them. They are threshed with the fails of Frankish steel, which implies that people have been slain by enemy swords. They lay life down on the threshing floor and winnow soul from body. The bloody banks of the Nemiga were unhappily sown, sown with the bones of Russian sons. The use of the metaphor of threshing and the term to winnow, a word which means to blow air, suggests a process much like the separation of chaff from wheat. And then after this we have the imagery of sowing of bones into the earth. I hope these agricultural references are clear, but if we look at the next passage, it then reads... The black earth underneath the horse's hooves was sown with bones and watered with blood. These sprouted as grief on the Russian soil. This beautifully symbolic passage tells of how the body returns to the earth, furthering the agricultural metaphor by suggesting that, like seeds being planted to regrow, the fact that bones are in the ground would suggest that people would grow again coming from the ground but in addition to this that these people would know grief which is a rather somber thought from a poet who probably had seen much war but for us we shall put the beauty of the poetry aside and look at this separation of a body at death into its various parts it is a consistent motif in these Indo-European myths and reflects the Indo-European perception about how the world is built. And perhaps one of the clearest examples we see of this is in the Old Norse text from the Prose Edda. From Emir's flesh was earth created, and from blood, sea, rocks, bones, trees of hair, and from his skull, the sky. And from his eyelashes the joyous gods made Mithgarth for men's sons, and from his brains were those cruel clouds all created. I've shown in previous videos that this creation myth has evolved from an earlier central myth of creation, and what I will read next is a reconstruction of this creation myth based on the work of Bruce Lincoln, David Anthony and myself. This is based on the later Proto-Indo-European migrations and will give you the context to place the rest of the discussion within this video so you can understand the cosmogony even more clearly. Before the beginning there was nothing. This was before time, before the beginning. There was just darkness. And from within the darkness time began and when time began so the cosmos produced fire and ice. This was the beginning of the cosmos, and within it two brothers were formed, twins, their names Manus and Gemo, and with them was a giant cow. Through time gods were created, both good and chaotic, and through the cosmos they all existed, and through the eons they lived and grew until the brothers decided that they needed a home, a place on which to live, to inhabit, to create a place of order from the chaos of the cosmos. But to create this world, a sacrifice had to be made. And so it was that Yimo agreed to be sacrificed, and Manus killed Yimo, offering the body to the god Dias Buddha, considered the most influential of the gods. Manus cut Yimo's body into pieces, and from these he created the world, the sun, the moon, the sea, the stars. He created fire and the winds. Finally, Manus created people from Yimo's head, torso and legs. From the head he created the first king, who he named Yimo. And from the torso he created the first warrior, who he called Trito. And from the legs he created the farmers and the labourers, the providers of food. The king was crowned and swore that he would sacrifice himself if necessary to keep the people safe and the land fertile. And Trito fought the people's enemies, the chaos, the dragons. And then Manus came down to the world and became the first priest and taught that through ritual sacrifice 
people would be allowed to have the world kept in order. And so Manus had sacrificed Jimo to Deus Pater, and the gods showed their approval and gave cattle to Trito, made from the primordial cow, a gift that would allow people to be rich in food and materials, and all seemed good. The story then talks about the slaying of the first dragon on what is known as the cattle raiding myth, but that is not important for this journey and I talk about that in other videos, but what we need to consider as important is how humans were treated in death. In previous videos, I've talked about humans being a microcosm of the cosmos and the cosmos being a macrocosm of man. And to enable this, we need to understand that in death, the Indo-Europeans considered that there was a transfer of materials, substances from the microcosm to the macrocosm. So blood, entered into water, breath to wind, flesh into earth, and so forth. And it is this latter idea of earth as being the receptacle of the body's flesh, and as well as the receiver of bone and fat and sinew. In effect, earth was treated as a residual category in which most, not all bodily matter was assigned to, was well, this was considered the cosmic resting places. This material was allocated. You could consider it a catch-all category. And this doesn't quite sit right with those who know the earlier creation myths, as they were more specific in the categorization of where materials came from. And so, why is this? Why would this be? And the answer probably lies in burial practices, where the bodily remains were literally consigned directly to the earth. However, for completeness, it is also worth noting that there is also much information about burial practices and there are multiple theories that could be considered. And up to this point, I've covered Greek and Old Norse and Russian sources, but we must also understand that the Zoroastrian text, the Zad Sparam, has a similar alignment, as well as the Hindu Briyadhanika Upanishad, where we see the great sage Artabaga interrogate the even greater sage Yanevake, and I shall read a passage from this that is important in putting this together. Yanevake, he said, when the voice of a dead man enters the fire, his breath the wind, his eye the sun, his mind the moon, his ear the cardinal directions, his flesh the earth, his self the atmosphere, his bodily hair, the herbs, the hair of his head, the trees, and his blood and semen are deposited in the waters. What then does this man become? Take my hand, dear Artabaga. Only we two will know of this. It is not to be spoken of by us here in the presence of others. What Artabaga is teaching here is the nature of death and the body's fate, aligning to the many other Indo-European sources. But what Yane Valke adds is new ideas to this old theme, for we are told that once the two sages had gone off into private, they spoke. Karma was what they spoke about. Then they praised. Karma was what they praised. And in this context, karma is the theory of cyclical rebirths that depend on deeds performed in previous lives, and this is a new belief in the early Upanishads, completely absent from the earlier sources, and it is this that quickly become a dominant consideration of the Indian religion and philosophy. We see in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad that this idea is presented as a sacred secret, reserved knowledge for only the greatest sages, Artabaga also implies that death is treated as a form of sacrifice, and this is because he consistently uses the name Perusa, the name of the first sacrificial victim, a name we consider as being a representation of Manu, the first man, because sometimes the Indo-Europeans swap the sacrificial victim from Yimo to Manu, and then often sacrifice the cow to produce plants and animals after this. And this isn't considered a significant point in the overall reconstruction of the creation myth and the cosmogony. And 
to help understand this process of rebirth, there is a passage in the Satipatha Brahmana which begins by asking what happens to the fire when it is extinguished and then it considers the fate of the body at death as a parallel process to when life is extinguished. When the fire goes out it is dispersed into the wind, therefore they say it is finished for truly it is dispersed into the wind. When the sun sets it enters the wind, the moon and the cardinal directions are established in the wind and they are born again from the wind. He knows thus, he goes forth from this world, he enters the fire with his voice, the sun with his eye, the moon with his mind, the cardinal directions with his ear, the wind with his breath, he having become one who is made thus, having become whichever of the deities he desires, he is at rest. And this allows us to start understanding what our ancestors really thought would happen when you die. You see, this passage says that the fire is finished, but it is not really finished, it has just become part of the wind. And in a similar vein, the sun does not die at sunset, but also becomes part of the wind. So just as the sun reappears each morning, so too fire can reappear from its temporary residence in the wind, which we see when wind is blown onto hot coals and causes a fire to restart. This idea can then be applied to the human body and its life, so that in death, whilst it looks like the end of life, for the body enters the cosmos, there is now a strong implication that the body would be reborn from the cosmos, like fire and sun from the wind. And we can find the earliest attestation of this view of death found in an extremely important hymn of the Rig Veda, which is devoted to the funerary fire. This text could have been written as early as 1200 BCE, and in it, the priest instructs the deceased, Your eye must go to the sun, yourself must go to the wind, you must go to the heaven and earth, according to what is right, or you must go to the waters, if that is fated for you. You must stand in the plants with your flesh. Now this is very interesting as it gives two alternative destinations for the body. The first aligns with the other texts we have seen. But the second possible fate for the body is more aligned to the agricultural themes we first read. This could be representative of different beliefs coming together, the new replacing the old. But it could also be that if the body could not replenish the cosmos, then it followed the other journey and in effect follows the model of the primordial bovine becoming food in the form of water and plants. We see this transformation of the corpse attested to in the Iranian Vitavat when the wise lord answers to related questions. How does he dispose of corpses? And how do the cosmic seas work? I, Ahura Mazda, carry away the corpse. I, Ahura Mazda, carry away the afterbirth. I, Ahura Mazda, cause bones to be sent away. I, Ahura Mazda, wash off that which is impure. I wash these together to the Putika Sea, which means purifying sea. These contents stream into the sea by virtue of their purification there. The waters run from the Puitka Sea to the Vuru Kasa Sea, which is the name for the cosmic ocean, to the tree of the good waters. There all my plants grow, all growing by the hundreds, the thousands, the myriads of myriads. I cause all these to rain down together. I, who am Ahura Mazda, as food, for the right possessing man as pasture for the beneficent cow. My grain, man shall eat that. The pasture is for the beneficent cow. You must stand in the plants with your flesh. Just as in the last part of the Rig Veda passage I read a few minutes ago, here the deceased enters the waters and the plants, and we then are explicitly told that these are to be understood as food, which will be consumed by men and cattle alike, and from which their bodies will be rebuilt. And from this, I don't think it is wrong to assume that just as a man's death is a reflection of the death of the first man, 
then an animal's death is repeating the fate of the first animal, from whose body food was created. And if this is the case, then we could speculate that just as an animal death might do service for a human victim in sacrifice, its body becoming the cosmos instead of just food, so to a human corpse might assume the fate ordinarily reserved for animals becoming food instead of part of the cosmos. But this is speculation and could be linked to bad karma. But to be clear, there's no specific data I have found to support this, but there's also no data I've found to counter this. And so we can at least conclude that there are times when there was a belief that some human bodies became food for the animals that are then used to feed humans. Sacrifices are a repetitive ritual act and so death as it is considered sacrifice is a repetitive ritual act every death repeats every other death and so every sacrifice but most of all the sacrifice represents the first death which was also a result of the first sacrifice and most importantly affected the creation of the universe for while death is the fate of all human beings death was also considered a cosmogenic act whenever people die their bodies replenish sustain or even recreate parts of the cosmos and this is the key premise of the indo-european religion it's defining cosmogony that is that there is no movement without a counter movement no cosmogony without an answering anthropogony no shift of matter which is not balanced by a shift in the opposite direction but is there a creation without destruction well to look at creation like this isn't quite right creation doesn't happen after destruction but instead runs simultaneously with destruction when a creature is created some of the cosmos is lost and conversely when new parts of the cosmos are created then creatures are decomposed or destroyed once we understand that creation happens at the same time as destruction then it is just logical that if the cosmos eventually collapses through some eschatological event, then at the same time many bodies will be created or resurrected at that same time, at what would be for some also the end of time. And we can read of these events within the Indo-European texts such as Ragnarok in the Old Norse poem, Volus Ball, Hesiod's work days, Denkat, Manava, Dharmasastra, Strabo and the Tainbo Colonnae. We even have the Song of the Little World in the Welsh book of the Telesin, which has the line The world, how it comes again, when it falls in decay, again in the enclosing circle. The study of the end of the world motif is called eschatology, and to understand what happens after such an event, we can read several sources. Some Iranian sources provide details. You know, detailed descriptions of the resurrection of the dead and one of the easiest to understand is given in the Pallavi uh, river yat accompanying the dadestan e denig he who is the chief so sayings who was the eschatological hero the accomplisher of the renovation and those who are his assistants set out on the resurrection of the body and ur mazd summons bone from the earth blood from the water hair from the plants and life breath from the wind he mixes one with the other and he keeps creating the form proper to each what we have here is in this passage is a process whereby death is reversed with the parts of the cosmos that receive the components of life now having those same components extracted to create life but you may say how can one tell which parts of the cosmos represent each individual's body? Which piece belongs to who? And we see in the Zad Sparam a passage that narrates this issue, with the cosmos saying that it has received so many bodies, how can it tell them apart in their component forms? And so it is up to the wise Lord to distinguish them all and to reassemble each individual as they were in life. The process begins with the reforming of Gaia Mud, whose name is cognate with Yemo, the twin figure, the primordial being 
from whose body the cosmos was created. And so at the end of the cosmos, the eschaton, the cosmogony reverses, as the man from whom the cosmos was made is now made from the cosmos. And this just doesn't apply to gamma. This applies to each individual who has lived and died. When their bodies are decreated at death, they create the cosmos. And when the cosmos is decreated at the eschaton, their bodies are recreated from it. But this idea isn't the sole preserve of the Indo-Iranians. We see this idea preserved in numerous tales, including Russian folk songs as well. And while these are not placed in a context of an eschatology, they are very much recognisable with some of these songs written in their current form uh, within the last couple of hundred years. And this is an example of a lament for the Tsar. Flow, flow, threatening cloud, pour out strong, dense rain. Soak up, damp mother earth. Open yourself, damp mother earth, in all four directions. Open your coffin boards, fling yourself open. Thin white shroud, get up, get up, you righteous Tsar. And what is particularly interesting about this example is that we see the use of water here in the form of rain as the mechanism to give the taken materials of the dead back to them. Now, being such a modern lament, it is doubtful that such a religious miracle was actually expected to occur. But what seems to be the case is that this motif has now become an expression of grief at death, especially if you consider the commonality of these motifs. And so these narratives have become the things you should say to your loved ones who have died. With regards to other Indo-European cultures, we can be sure that both the Thracians and the Celts had views of an existence beyond death, but exactly what they were, we can't be really sure of. However, there are hints at this. One of the best ones I can find is Pharsalia's epic of the Civil War, which reads, According to you as authorities, the shades do not travel to the silent abodes of Erebus and the pallid dominions of Dis in the deep. The same spirit rules over bodily members in the other world. Death is the midpoint of a long life. If you sing things which are rightly known. Now, this is of interest because it doesn't discuss the soul, but focuses on the body and in particular the limbs or what is referred here to as the bodily members. These are seen as being reconstituted after death as death is only a moment of transition between different ways of existing but like many things to do with the druids and, and the celtic culture primary and secondary sources is frustratingly sparse and there isn't really much more i can add now whilst there is more information about these sorts of events in old norse literature much of these stem around Ragnarok, and this event is now seen by many scholars as a independent variant of broader, more ancient eschatological traditions, and so providing confirmation of a central belief in this idea. Although, whilst I'm talking about Ragnarok, we often see some arguing that the ending of the poem is corrupted, and the Christian influence is perhaps distorting what our conclusion should be. However, this tends to be the opinion of those who have less knowledge of the teaching of Christian missionaries, as Christian missionaries did not have eschatological themes, which we see here. And so what we're seeing is the Germanic tribes version of those core eschatons in Indo-European culture. And so because of that, we can be confident Ragnarok has come from the pagan eschaton, the Germanic tribes, are not Christian influence. And the Old Norse version of this is most recognisable in the Volospor, the poem which I mentioned earlier in this video, where Odin influences a vulva to speak with him on things past and future. And if we look at a few of the stanzas, we can see what it says about the world in the aftermath of the collapse of the earth and the heavens. I see it come up another time, the earth from the sea, eternally green. Waterfalls flow, an eagle flies over the mountains, hunting for fish. The Asir, the Mita, died of all, and talk of the mighty earth encircler. 
and there we call the mighty dooms and Fimbletir's ancient mysteries. Then afterward, they will find the wondrous gold gaming pieces in the grass, which they possessed in the old days. Unsown fields will grow, all misfortune will heal, Baldur will come, Odd and Baldur will dwell there in Hroth's battlefield, the temple of the gods of the slain. Would you know more or what? Then Honir is able to work the sacrificial wands, and the sons of the brothers of Tevegi dwell in the wide wind home. Would you know more or what? These stanzas show that there is a reversal of events after the eschaton. The earth comes back out of the sea, and it even talks of the gold gaming pieces being found again, which were initially spoken of at the start of times when the gods played games when the earth was new. But what is of most interest is the resurrection of Baldur and Hod, his brother who killed him due to Loki's trickery. These are two slain sons of Odin, and their resurrection is very clear. And we even see Snorri Sturluson say this in the Gilfaganin of the Prose Edda, that they came from Hel, the realm of the dead, a place where Baldur could not be released, or not until after the cosmos was destroyed by Ragnarok. But for all this evidence about resurrection after the eschaton, we know nothing about how this resurrection happens, nor if others are resurrected, although we do see the appearance of a little spoken about figure, Tveggi, whose name means twin, and so whose appearance could be a reference to the old Norse Ymir, or the Germanic Twisko, the equivalent of Yimo, the primordial twin. There are also issues with this consideration, with the talk of Tevegi having brothers, where we know him only to have one in the creation story. And so this suggests he may be representing something else. But to look into this requires a very different video, and one I may make in the future. So let me know in the comments if that's what you want. But the point I'm trying to show, the point of looking at Ragnarok, is to show that uh, Germanic eschatological tradition shares important features with Iranian accounts of the renovation. In both, a resurrection is one of the final acts of restoration after the collapse of the cosmos, with new men or new versions of men appearing. And we also see this in Greek myth as well. And so if we go back to where I started and consider all I have spoken about, then we would end up back in Greece. And we have the myth of Deucalion and Pyla. It is first mentioned in Hesiod and Pindar's work, but has most written about it in Apollodorus's Bibliotheca and Ovid's Metamorphosis. This myth has Deucalion and Pyla as the sole survivors of the flood in which Zeus creates to put an end to the race of bronze. And so they are thus the first humans of our own age, and they are also the first mortal humans born from the immortal titans and it is prometheus their father who creates all other humans out of water and earth now for clarification some of you who are familiar with greek classics may be saying well pandora was the first woman but she was not the first woman who was born and this is a subtle but necessary difference to point out but back to the flood and with this flood we see one age of the earth end and with Deucalion and Pyla surviving in their ark another age begins but these two survivors face a problem of how to repopulate the earth so they seek an oracle's wisdom to help this endeavour and I shall read some of the text from Ovid's Metamorphoses to explain what happens. The goddess was moved by their supplications and said to the oracle depart from the temple Cover your head, unbind your girded garments, and throw the bones of your dear mother behind you. For a long time they stood amazed, and Pyla first broke the silence with her voice. She refused to obey the goddess's commands. Trembling, she asked forgiveness for herself, for she feared to offend her mother's shade 
by tossing her bones about. Meanwhile, they repeated in the dark hiding places the obscure words the oracle given, each considering them separately. Then Prometheus's son soothed Epimetheus's daughter with tranquil words. Either our ingenuity is deceitful, he said, or nothing is pious and the oracle's advice, a sinful deed. Our dear mother is the earth. I believe the stones in the earth's body are what we called bones, and we are ordered to throw them behind us. Although Pala was moved by her husband's interpretation, still her hope was in doubt. What is more, both of them distrusted the heavenly prophecies. But what could it hurt to try? They separated, covered their heads, ungirded their tunics, and threw the stones behind their own footsteps. The rocks, who would believe this if antiquity did not testify to it, began to give up their hardness and their rigidity and gradually to attain a softer, more pliable form. Soon, when they had been born, a milder nature was reached by them and it seemed like a human form, not plainly, but more like a statue as it is in the beginning. Of these rocks, that part which was dampened, moisture somewhere and earthy, that turned into the flesh of the body. That which was solid and unable to bend changed to bone, and that which was the veins remained under the same name. And in brief time, according to the will of the gods, the rock stone by the man's hands assumed the figure of men, and from each female throw a woman was remade. This story's core is repeated in Iran, repeated in Scandinavia, and in other places in the Indo-European landscape, the resurrection of humanity immediately after the destruction of the world. The only difference is that the cataclysm is somewhat more limited in this myth, affecting only the surface of the earth, not the entire cosmos. Moreover, the myth of Deucalion and Pilo goes beyond the Germanic accounts of its detailed description of how humanity was recreated. In this resumed in the Iranian and Slavic materials, we see flesh is made out of the soft earth and bones out of the hard stones. And these are two very similar ideas to the homologies within the Russian laments. I have shown that at death it was believed that a body dissolves into its constituent elements to rejoin those parts within the cosmos. And at birth, these same elements are drawn out of the cosmos and recombined into a human or a plant or animal. But what we also see is that nothing is ever born for the first time, as every birth is a rebirth, a reconstitution of cosmic material, shifting from macrocosm to the microcosm, and this represents a resurrection. And so, equally important is that death is never final. It is just a temporary separation of elements, a shifting of material from the microcosm back to the macrocosm. The outlines of the Indo-European cosmology is clear, even if not all details are preserved equally amongst all religious texts. Death and resurrection are informed by the creation mythology, alongside healing practices and sacrificial ritual, the idea being that the material cosmos and the human body are complementary opposites, intimately interrelated and infinitely interchangeable. When the world was created, it was created out of humans through either cosmogony, sacrifice or death. And when humankind is created, whether in anthropogony, nutrition, healing or resurrection, it is created from the cosmos. The creation of one implies the destruction of the other. The matter from which humans and the cosmos are made has always existed and always will exist, transitioning between humans and cosmic forms and so cosmogony and eschatology are moments of transition, although on a gigantic, sometimes universal scale. But there's another point I haven't touched on, but I will we'll do properly in a video in the future. But for now, I'll just mention about it, and that's eating and healing. 
So within our Indo-European cultural beliefs, the materials used to eat comes from plants and animals, and the materials used to heal come from plants and animals. These two are formed from the cosmos. And so by applying these to yourself, by digesting these materials, you are in effect rebuilding yourself. In effect, you are forcibly making material in the cosmos transition into flesh and blood and bone. Well, that is how our ancestors saw this. And so if you want to know more about this aspect of Indo-European cosmogony, then just let me know in, again in the comments below as you pass that like and subscribe button. Eschatology, or certainly eschatology in the sense of the Indo-Europeans, is not just a destruction of the Earth or the cosmos. It is a creation event because humans are created as the cosmos is decreated. It's a symmetrical process and one that we can also link to plants and animals, depending on where your material goes when you die, as it can flow in various ways to keep the cosmos, animals, plants and humans alive. All material has a cycle and can end up anywhere in the cosmos. Material when we're born, when we eat, drink and die. But if we look at this another way, all things are just an allo form of everything else. And knowing that, then we can say the cosmos is a circular system with myths of creation leading to cosmic destruction that leads to cosmic creation. But in terms of material, there is in truth no such thing as creation or destruction. All that ever will be is here already. The cosmogonic system can therefore be said to have four key points, that man and the cosmos are other forms of each other. Material is eternal in its existence, but can transition between forms infinitely. Time is infinite, as this process will continue ad infinitum. And change is constant. For those who understand this, who comprehend the Indo-European view of matter and its forms, well, they could then argue that they have knowledge to manipulate this matter and so manipulate all things in the cosmos. Taking this further, this is not a cosmological theory, as when one looks at the Vedic texts or the words of the wise one, we see not requests of the cosmos, but commands, commands that a fully knowledgeable priest could use to bend the cosmos to their will. And we see priests from the Vedic, Celtic, Germanic, Iranian and other cultures claim that they possess the ability to create and decreate the universe through the performance of sacrifice. You may think that such claims are a combination of well, a somewhat confident and audacious behaviour, but to some, these ideas were considered nothing less than the secrets of the universe. And this is a key religious thought. Now, I want to thank my patrons for their continued support and great questions. And I want to thank you all for watching until the end of this video, which I hope you found informative and will help you with any of your studies and research. I'll link to the video of the Fair Man of the Dead below if you want to watch it. I've got a great video about sacrifice, which is a brilliant follow on to this video if you're interested. And with that, thank you for all your support, all your kind words and comments, for liking, for subscribing, and for watching, and for drinking tea or coffee or whatever beverage suits you. And with that, please stay safe and well. And this was Crackenford.